Um, thanks for coming along uh, on Culture Night to hear a little bit about William Carlos Williams. I've got my shoulder to two of you. There we go. Um, he is one of my favorite poets. He has been since I was a kid. Um, he was born in Rutherford, New Jersey on September 17, 1883, and he attended the University of Pennsylvania. Now, I was born and raised in Philadelphia, which is just across the bridge from New Jersey. Uh, the University of Pennsylvania was just down the road from where I grew up, and my birthday happens to be September 16th, so we're only a day apart on the calendar. Uh, but all of these things I've only discovered in the last couple of weeks. That's not what I liked about him as a kid. Um, and I do mean as a kid, he was introduced to us in American schools quite early. Um, and what I loved about him from the start was the short lines, the simple words, the word pictures or images that he uses. Rarely abstract, never corny, as I would have said when I was a kid. Um, colored by normal, everyday language that anybody could appreciate. And one of the first poems of his that I read, um, I don't have it here with me, but it, it described a shepherd with a red blanket on his left shoulder. And the red blanket, the words red and blanket, were all the way at the left-hand margin of the page to give you that sense of the red on the left to mimic the actual figure of the shepherd. And I was just six or seven and thought, God, that's so cool. You know, what an interesting way to present a poem. And the other poem that I knew of his is one that probably all of you know, which we're going to have up on the, on the board in a little while. It's called This Is Just To Say. I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. So here we have a poem that sounds like a note of a husband that a husband left for a wife. And we get an image of Williams coming in. Um, he was a very busy doctor. He mostly did obstetrics and gynecology. He brought over 3,000 babies into the world. Uh, so he obviously would be out, you know, at all hours uh, looking after women in labor. And uh, we have this wonderful homey image of him coming home and his wife's in bed, and he's tiptoeing around in the dark, and he finds the plums in the icebox, and eats them, and is feeling at home and relaxed, and wants to apologize to his wife. Although I don't think he's all that sorry, is he? <laughs> um, so this is the book, A River of Words, and this is his life story, uh, told for children, but I think, I mean, it's just such a wonderfully accessible way to hear his life story. So we'll when I was a preschool teacher, my favorite time of the day was story time. So this is kind of bringing me back to that. <laughs> um, okay. Like the other boys in Rutherford, New Jersey, Willie Williams loved to play baseball and to race his friends up and down the street. But when the other boys went inside, Willie stayed outside, climbing over the fence in his backyard. He wandered alone through the woods and fields. In those days, just beyond town, there were still many wild places for Willie to explore. My Willie has sharp eyes. He notices everything, his mother told the neighbors, and it was true. As he walked through the high grasses and along the soft dirt paths, Willie watched everything. When he grew tired, he stretched out beside the Passaic River. Gurgle, gurgle, swish, swish, swoosh, gurgle, gurgle. The water went slipping and sliding over the smooth rocks, then poured in a torrent over the falls, then quieted again below. The river's music both excited and soothed Willie. Sometimes, as he listened to its perfect tune, he fell asleep. As Willie grew older, there was less time to wander through the woods and fields or to nap by the river. In high school, Willie had classes and track practice and lots of homework. Willie is always in a hurry, his mother told the neighbors, and it was true. But when Mr. Abbott read poetry to Willie's English class, Willie did not feel hurried. The gentle sounds and shifting rhythms of the poems were like the music of the river. As the teacher read each line, Willie closed his eyes and let them make pictures in his mind. One night, alone in his room, Willie began to write his own poems. At first, he imitated the famous English writers he had learned about at school. He counted the beats in each line and made the endings rhyme. 
The archer is awake, the swan is flying, gold against blue, an arrow is lying. Poetry suited Willie. Every night he looked forward to sitting at his desk and writing a few new lines. But after a while he grew frustrated. He had pictures in his mind that didn't fit exactly into steady rhythms or rhymes. I have never seen a swan or an archer, Willie thought. I want to write about ordinary things. Plums, wheelbarrows and weeds, fire engines, children and trees. Things I see when I walk down my street or look out the window. So Willie tried writing a new way. Instead of counting the beats or making the end words rhyme, he let each poem find its own special shape on the page. There is a bird in the poplars. It is the sun. The leaves are little yellow fish swimming in the river. It's easy to forget now how revolutionary this was, that he was doing away with the rhyme, he was doing away with the these and the thous and the or and the yonders, and using ordinary words and ordinary language, everyday language that everybody could understand. The Japanese were doing it for centuries in uh, what we call haiku, those little bitty three-line poems that just pre present an image. But the English, the Americans, the Europeans they were a little bit slower to get to that. So this was quite a, a surprising and revolutionary thing. Now when he wrote poems, he felt as free as the Passaic River as it rushed to the falls. Willie's notebooks filled up, one after another. My boy is a good writer, his mother said, and it was true. Unfortunately, no one paid much money for poetry, and Willie needed to earn a living. So some things never change. Um, I love this picture, I just wanted to say that. He's depicted here with all the, you know, bits of, of lines for different poems stuck up on the wall around his desk. Now, I don't know if that's really how he worked, but I can tell you, as being a poet and living with a poet as well, that's how most of us work, um, you know, as well, writing down bits of ideas on backs of envelopes and receipts and whatever's handy and hoping that they're going to come together. Yeah, so there's a poem on the other side. It says, the little sparrows hop ingeniously about the pavement quarreling with sharp voices over things that interest them. Willie's mother had told him stories about her elder brother, Carlos, who was a doctor. When our father died, she told Willie, Carlos' salary provided for our whole family. Willie liked the idea of healing people and of providing for a family, but could he do both and still write poetry? At age 19, Willie went off to study medicine at the university, where he met Ezra Pound, Hilda Doolittle, and Charles Demuth. I'm wondering if I'm pronouncing that right. D-E-M-U-T-H, visual artist? We'll go with Demuth. Uh, Ezra and H.D. were studying literature while Charlie studied painting. The friends spent many afternoons together discussing books, music, and art. The harder Willie's medical training became, the more he enjoyed the time that he spent with them. And there's, oh right, okay, that's, yeah, that's the one I was thinking. That's a, a William Carlos Williams poem. Among the rain and lights, I saw the figure gold on a red fire truck moving, tense, unheeded, to gong clangs, siren howls, and wheels rumbling through the dark city. So it's a wonderful image of a, of a fire truck racing through the night. And his friend Charles Demuth did a painting that was honoring that poem, which we're going to see in a little while. And we'll, we'll read the poem again at that time. So when he graduated, William returned to Rutherford and hung his sign, Williams, William C. Williams, MD, Family Medicine. Every morning, Dr. Willie Williams filled his black bag with medicines and instruments and drove off to visit patients in their homes. Every afternoon, he returned to his office where more patients waited. All day, he delivered babies, healed hurts and bruises, set broken bones, and wrote prescriptions for coughs and fevers. Dr. Williams is the busiest man in town, said the neighbors, and it was true. But no matter how many babies he delivered, no matter how many sick people he cured, Willie could not stop writing poems. 